Hi, this is Andrew Shore here from the Washington Hospital Center with two important articles I want to review regarding the care of the critically ill patient. Both of these are from JAMA in the month of May, and for those of us in pulmonary and critical care who take care of patients in the ICU, both of these articles are important. The first, by Ferrer and colleagues in uh, the later issue of JAMA at the end of May, dealt with the surviving sepsis campaign. What these authors did in Spain, in multiple ICUs, and including several thousand patients, was design a before and after study where they looked at what their outcomes were with septic patients, implemented the surviving sepsis bundle through education, efforts to encourage adherence and compliance, and then looked at mortality not only in the follow-up period, but also looked at mortality long-term and mortality at a year end. What these authors found, first of all, was that compliance with the components of the surviving sepsis campaign, which include issues about diagnostics, therapeutics, volume resuscitation, prevention of complications, compliance overall was very low with the guidelines. The few things that were being done, quote, right prior to the educational effort about the guidelines was delivery of initial and appropriate antibiotic therapy in terms of broad spectrum antibiotics. What these authors saw after an educational initiative, which took a long time and a lot of effort, was a decrease in mortality in their population from about 44% to less than 40%. So a small reduction, about 4 or 5%, but a statistically, and I would argue clinically meaningful one. What they found, however, was even with this educational initiative, rates of compliance with all of the sepsis care bundles actually increased only marginally. And unfortunately, at a year out, most of behavior had lapsed. As I think this study demonstrates, as numbers of others of studies have demonstrated, we as clinicians are horrible recidivists, uh, and we go back to practicing our prior behavior, whether it's right or wrong, unless people are constantly working to educate us. This is one of the few large national and international studies of a bundle approach to sepsis, and the results are generally positive. Other before-after studies using sepsis bundles and guidelines have shown that not only can we improve mortality, but we can decrease cost. Now, these authors didn't de look at uh, length of stay, or rather didn't see a difference in length of stay or resource utilization, but the study was empowered to look at that. In all, I think it's more evidence that if we take an ownership approach to sepsis care that involves key aspects of evidence-based medicine, such as aggressive fluid resuscitation, early appropriate broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy, consideration of uh, activated protein C and appropriate candidates, all of those pieces are important to the management of the septic patient, and you can't just do them piecemeal. Unfortunately, what this paper demonstrates is that compliance is hard to achieve and it takes consistent effort. Now, with a lot of effort, they got compliance up a little and got a little return on investment. One can only speculate what the benefit might be, and that's what it would be speculation, if compliance rates were even higher. Because each of the components of the surviving sepsis campaign and the sepsis bundles we all discuss have been generally shown to be associated with significant mortality improvements. So I think the message for clinicians is we have to take a multifaceted approach to the care of these patients, including cooperating with our colleagues not only in the ICU, but our colleagues outside the ICU, particularly in the emergency department, for early patient recognition and initiation of aggressive fluids and antibiotics. The second article by Parenti and colleagues dealt with catheter-related bloodstream infections. Catheter-related bloodstream infections are now a major quality measure for uh, JCO and CMS. CMS has actually proposed that it's not going to pay for any hospital-acquired bloodstream infections anymore. It thinks it's going to provide zero reimbursement. And certainly a lot of efforts have been made to prevent catheter-related complications based on a lot of the work from the group in Michigan and all of the Keystone Quality Initiatives. And certainly through decreasing utilization of catheters, decreasing the duration of catheterization, good skin prep, sterile technique, appropriate site selection, we can really drive down these rates. Unfortunately, I don't think we can get these rates to zero because some patients are very high risk. One of the super high risk categories for catheter-related bloodstream infections are patients who develop acute renal failure and need a catheter for renal replacement therapy. Those patients are generally critically ill. Those patients have generally already been on broad-spectrum antibiotics. They're going to require a catheter for a prolonged period of time. And so generally, the risk for catheter-related bloodstream infection is enhanced or enriched. These authors performed a multi-center randomized control trial in France where they randomized patients to either a catheter in the femoral site or the jugular site. For non-tunneled, non-dialysis catheters, similar groups from France have shown that rates of infectious complications aren't much different between the two sites. There are differences in hemorrhagic complications and mechanical ones. In this study, among 750 patients who were well-balanced at baseline, these authors saw that there was actually no difference overall in infectious complications between the jugular site for the dialysis catheter and the femoral site. 
What this demonstrates once again is that both of these sites are prone to infection. What they did see was a higher risk for hematoma with the jugular site. It's less compressible, may be difficult to access, all of these issues come into play. There was no difference in mortality, and these authors actually defined infection not only as a bloodstream infection, but as catheter colonization. And it's unclear what catheter colonization means because that may or may not eventually be a harbinger of final bloodstream infection. There was, in fact, no difference in bloodstream infection. When they did look, however, what they found that was intriguing was that your risk for catheter colonization varied by site, but also by body weight. So overall, there was no difference in infectious complications, but in the lighter people, the people with BMI, say, of less than 25, what they saw was that the jugular site was actually associated with higher rates of catheter colonization, whereas in the more obese patients, the higher BMIs, there was less infection in the femoral site. So interesting in that we as clinicians may need to choose sites based on what the patient looks like. And that makes sense because the technical ease, which is an important issue in determining whether a catheter is going to be colonized and the ability to care for it, makes sense that it's going to be a function of how big the person is, right? If you can't keep the site clean because it's under a large panis, well, maybe you don't want to pick a site like that. And again, remember, these are catheters that we're not going to remove haphazardly. These are likely catheters that are going to be in for a while. So overall, I think this gives us more information that catheter prevention needs to remain an important goal and that site selection can be an important issue for those of us in the ICU who care for critically ill patients needing long-term catheters for acute renal failure. This is Andy Shore from Washington, D.C. Have a good week.